This is the seventh video in this series on interpreting chest x-rays, and the topic is diffuse lung disease. The learning objectives are, first, to be able to identify and know the differential diagnosis of low lung volumes and hyperinflation. Second, to be able to identify pulmonary edema, as well as specific features that can help distinguish cardiogenic from non-cardiogenic etiologies. Third, to be able to classify interstitial processes based on their radiographic features. And finally, to be able to compare typical findings in alveolar and interstitial processes. The first topic in this video will be a very brief discussion of lung volumes. So here is an x-ray which shows an example of reduced lung volumes. We know this because when we count ribs, there are only seven full posterior ribs seen above the diaphragm where normally there should be 9 to 10. When describing an x-ray with reduced lung volumes, it is important to describe it specifically as such and never as, quote, poor inspiratory effort, which is frequently done. The reason for this is that as the x-ray interpreter, unless you were physically present when the x-ray was taken, you have no idea what the patient's inspiratory effort was like. Low lung volumes may be the first sign of otherwise occult disease of the lung interstitium of the diaphragm's neuromuscular apparatus or thoracic wall. Mislabeling this x-ray as poor inspiratory effort risks missing an opportunity at an early diagnosis of these conditions. Having said that, the most common etiology of reduced lung volume may in fact be poor inspiratory effort. It may also be the consequence of a suboptimally timed exposure. It can obviously be seen in restrictive lung disease due to any of the aforementioned general mechanisms. And finally, it can be the consequence of unappreciated subpulmonic effusions, which were discussed in the last video in this series. In contrast to low lung volumes, we can instead see hyperinflation, which in my experience is less common. There is no widely applied precise definition of hyperinflation on x-ray. Instead, the term refers to a subjective impression that the total lung capacity is likely increased if measured by pulmonary function tests. This subjective impression is based upon the number of ribs seen, flattening of the diaphragms, and a diffusely increased lucency of the lungs. Hyperinflation has a very short and specific differential diagnosis. It is most commonly seen in COPD. It can also occur occasionally in asthma, but only during acute exacerbations. For the remainder of this video, I'll be referring to the two classic radiographic categories of diffuse lung opacities. They are alveolar opacities, often referred to as airspace opacities, and interstitial opacities. While I will be discussing the features which distinguish one category from another, and discussing the subtypes of each, in practice, the distinction between alveolar and interstitial opacities is not easy. It is a skill that entails much subjectivity requires much experience, and typically shows significant inter-observer variation. A large part of these issues stems from the fact that few diffuse lung diseases are completely limited to only the air spaces or to the interstitium. Many diseases which are classically alveolar, such as pulmonary edema, may also demonstrate typical interstitial changes, and many diseases which are classically interstitial, such as sarcoidosis, may also demonstrate typical alveolar changes. As a consequence, many of the distinctions discussed during the rest of this video are not always obvious, and they may be a source of disagreement even between experienced healthcare professionals. Alveolar opacities are due to fluid accumulation within the alveoli and terminal bronchioles. This fluid may be edema, pus, or blood. Opacities are hazy with poorly defined margins, but can respect low bar boundaries unless diffuse. The differential diagnosis for most alveolar opacities can be divided into two main subtypes. First is cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is that associated with an elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is a surrogate for elevated left-sided heart pressures in general. 
This type of pulmonary edema can be seen in any cause of congestive heart failure. This includes exacerbations of long-standing cardiomyopathy, acute MI, arrhythmia, myocarditis, or acute aortic or mitral regurgitation secondary to endocarditis. Then there is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema in which the wedge pressure is normal. The clinical correlate to diffuse non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema is the spectrum between acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome. The distinction between these two is largely arbitrary and is based on the severity of a patient's hypoxemia. As with heart failure, ALI and ARDS are not etiologies themselves, but can be caused by a long and diverse list of pathologic conditions. These include severe sepsis, pneumonia, including viral pneumonia from things like influenza, aspiration pneumonitis, pancreatitis, severe burns, post-transfusion reaction, near drowning, extreme elevation, CNS catastrophe, and inhalational injury. In order to differentiate cardiogenic from non-cardiogenic edema on x-ray, there are five radiographic features which one can look for. They are air bronchograms, peribronchial cuffing, curly lines, cephalization, and the bat's wing pattern. I'll talk about each one at a time. First up are air bronchograms. Since bronchi are relatively thin-walled air-filled structures surrounded by air-filled alveoli, they are usually not visible on x-ray. However, opacification of alveoli adjacent to a bronchus results in the dark air-filled bronchi becoming identifiable against a white background. In this example, the patient has opacification of the right lower lung zone, probably the right middle lobe, as we will discuss in the next video. If we zoom in on the opacification, we can see an outline of a dark branching structure which are the bronchi. Visible bronchi are not only a manifestation of air bronchograms, but also of parabronchial cuffing. Interstitial edema can accumulate around bronchi, making the bronchial walls thick. This appears like a ring when seen in cross-section, and like tram tracks when seen longitudinally. Here's an x-ray with a number of different findings. If we zoom in again on the right mid-lung zone, we can see two ring-shaped structures adjacent to one another, which are bronchi seen in cross-section. Next are curly A and B lines. Curly A lines are diagonal, unbranching lines, 2 to 6 centimeters long, extending from the hilum. They represent channels between peripheral and central lymphatics. Curly B lines are faint, thin horizontal lines, 1 to 2 centimeters long, at the lung periphery, usually at the bases. They represent interlobular septa. In general, curly B lines are much more commonly seen and commonly referred to than curly A lines. In this example, if we zoom way in at the right lung base, we can see the tiny, faint, horizontal curly B lines, specifically indicating this patient may have mild heart failure. The term cephalization refers to increased visibility of pulmonary vessels at the lung apices as compared to the bases. It is suggestive of increased left atrial pressure. In this example, if we compare the average density of the pulmonary vessels in the apices to the mid-lung zones, we can see that they are more prominent in the apices. Unfortunately, cephalization is highly subjective and has relatively poor inter-observer agreement, limiting its utility as a radiographic distinguishing feature of pulmonary edema. Lastly, is the so-called bat's wing pattern of opacification, sometimes referred to alternatively as a butterfly pattern or angel's wings. This refers to bilateral perihilar concentration of opacification. This is seen predominantly in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but also in some types of pneumonia, particularly viral, PCP, and aspiration. It can be seen in inhalational injury, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, and in pulmonary hemorrhage. So how do these radiographic features help distinguish cardiogenic from non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema?
In cardiogenic edema, the cardiac size is typically enlarged, while in non-cardiogenic edema, it is typically normal. In cardiogenic edema, the regional distribution of opacities is relatively homogeneous, while it is relatively patchy in non-cardiogenic edema. Air bronchograms are common only in non-cardiogenic edema, while parabronchial cuffing is common only in cardiogenic edema. And concurrent pleural effusions and curly B lines are more common in cardiogenic. Although not listed explicitly in this chart, a bat wing pattern to the opacities is most consistent with cardiogenic edema, though it may be seen with some specific etiologies of non-cardiogenic edema, as listed on the previous slide. Finally, cephalization has historically been associated with cardiogenic edema. However, the subjectivity and lack of inter-observer agreement regarding this finding limits its usefulness. If you recall back to near the beginning of this video, you may remember that alveolar opacities can be caused not just by edema in the alveoli, but also by pus or blood. Therefore, etiologies of diffuse alveolar opacities without edema include multilobar pneumonia and diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. I'll now move on to discuss interstitial opacities. There are several subtypes of interstitial opacities based upon radiographic appearance. The first are reticular opacities, which essentially means there are too many lines. This can create a lace-like or net-like appearance. Another subtype is nodular opacities, which means there are too many dots or nodules. For diffuse interstitial disease, the nodules are almost always less than one centimeter in size. If the nodules are all less than two millimeters, it is sometimes referred to as a miliary pattern due to the fact that someone a long time ago thought the nodules looked like millet seeds. Finally, are reticulonodular opacities, which means there are too many lines and too many dots. So here's an example of a reticular pattern that is too many lines. And here is a nodular one. And the last, here are diffuse reticulonodular opacities. The differential diagnosis of diffuse interstitial opacities is very large and is generally difficult to place into categories or groups other than those diagnoses which cause a predominant reticular pattern and those which cause a predominant nodular pattern. Almost any cause of interstitial opacities can lead to a reticulonodular pattern. Those diseases which cause a predominantly reticular pattern of diffuse opacities include idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, connective tissue disease, atypical pneumonia, such as that caused by mycoplasma, the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, of which there are several histologic subtypes, which cannot be distinguished on plain radiographs, asbestosis, chronic aspiration, pulmonary drug toxicity, sarcoidosis, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and lymphangitis carcinomatosis. As I said, the differential diagnosis is very long. In some cases, there may be subtle clues pointing towards one diagnosis over others, such as the presence of pleural plaques, suggesting a reticular pattern is due to asbestosis. However, for the most part, most of these diseases are indistinguishable from one another on plain radiographs. When it comes to the causes of diffuse interstitial opacities that cause a predominantly nodular pattern, these can be broken down into those with nodules under 2 centimeters and those with nodules over 2 centimeters, provided one realizes that this cutoff is far from absolute. Those diseases causing small nodules include biliary tuberculosis, fungal infections, silicosis, coal workers pneumoconiosis, and sarcoidosis. Those which cause medium and large nodules include metastatic cancer, subacute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, lymphoma, sarcoidosis, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, and rheumatoid nodules. You probably noticed that sarcoidosis has shown up on all three lists, 
which is because sarcoidosis has a wide variety of manifestations in the lung. Along with causing either reticular or nodular interstitial patterns, sarcoidosis can also cause alveolar opacities and is best known radiographically as a cause of prominent hilar lymphadenopathy. I'll close this video with a summary of a comparison between alveolar and interstitial opacities. Alveolar opacities show lobar or segmental distribution unless they are diffuse or in the bat's wing pattern, while interstitial opacities do not respect lobar or segmental boundaries. The margin of alveolar opacities is relatively hazy, while interstitial opacities have a relatively sharp margin. Alveolar opacities may contain air bronchograms if they are caused by non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, while interstitial opacities are generally devoid of them. Alveolar opacities can change rapidly over time with an ability to appear and disappear within hours, while interstitial opacities generally evolve much more slowly. And finally, alveolar opacities are often described in highly subjective terms such as fluffy, cotton wool-like, or cloud-like. Interstitial opacities are described in the semi-objective terms of reticular, nodular, or reticulonodular. That concludes this video on diffuse lung processes. The next video in this series will cover focal lung processes.